thank you so much for uh, being here today for the penultimate um, uh, lecture in the Capit Center's Interdisciplinary Colloquia series. We have uh, one more to go, which is next month, May 8th, um, led by uh, Claudia here um, and uh, one of the two visiting doctoral students to talk to us about her work here, but also her, um, her time here at UMass Dartmouth for the past year. So that will wrap up the year. Uh, but for today, we have our distinguished uh, guest and visitor, a member of the Capit Center's advisory board, Professor Hyman Bass, a very distinguished uh, mathematician and math educator as well. Um, welcome, Hyman. It's a great pleasure to, to have you here. And he's been, um, uh, he's had a full schedule already today at the Capit Center with uh, faculty and students. So uh, I was driving him over here. We got in a stuck on 195 as always, I'm saying, are you okay to give a talk? I mean, <laughs> we drained you, but he, he said he's up for it. So, uh, and he wants it to be an interactive session today. So he's really up for it, so um, um, welcome. I'll just give a brief introduction. Uh, Hyman is the Samuel Ellenberg Distinguished University Professor of Mathematics and Mathematics Education at the University of Michigan. He has served as the president of the American Mathematical Society and the International Commission on Mathematical Instruction and is a chair of the National Academy of Sciences Mathematical Science Education Board. He is a member of the US National Academy of Sciences, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the Third World Academy of Sciences, and the National Academy of Education. I didn't know there were so many national academies. <laughs> uh, in 2006, uh, he received the US National Medal of Science, which is a highly prestigious award. His mathematical research spans various domains of algebra, notably algebraic K-theory and geometric group theory. His work in education, largely with Deborah Ball, focuses mainly on mathematical knowledge for teaching and on teaching and learning of mathematical practices, such as reasoning and proving, and discerning and developing mathematical structure in K-16 classrooms. So I welcome Professor Bass here today. I welcome the people who are joining us online. Um, there is a way for you to interact with us as well if you have questions for Professor Bass, and uh, they'll be mediated through, uh, through Rob. Um, so welcome, and over to you. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I think I had a crash course in the Cabot Center at a.m. I'm almost entitled to a degree. <laughs> I can be a <laughs> So my talk is about the last piece that Stephen mentioned, the uh, teaching of mathematical practices, which has become germane because of uh, the new common core standards, state standards, and mathematics. Uh, how many of you, probably easier to ask, how many of you are not familiar with the common core? So, uh, math education went through a somewhat troubled history of reforms. Uh, the first, the whole standards movement began with uh, what are called the NCTM standards, the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics. So they were, it was an attempt to surreptitiously uh, propose something approximating the national curriculum. Uh, but it was sponsored by the professional organization of teachers. It didn't have very broad input and that precipitated some adverse reactions, especially from mathematicians who couldn't understand their children's homework at one point with standards-based curriculum were developed. So there was a backlash about that. Uh, and then rather than achieve a coherent, approximately national curriculum, we created 50 different state standards, a system which is like building a railway system with different gauge tracks in every state. So that was quite irrational, but in the meantime, the problems of mathematics education were not adequately addressed. And uh, so the Common Core is another effort to do that, but uh, it was very politically astute in that uh, its sponsorship was not by the Professional Organization of Teachers, not even by the National Academy of Sciences, but by the National Governors Association and the 
council of the chief state school officers, which meant that it was hopefully immune to charges of co-opting local control. So far, it has uh, survived in that sense. Uh, it builds on and is somewhat of an improvement of the previous standards. Uh, and what I want to focus on today is an important feature of them. Uh, the standards uh, fall into two parts. Uh, one is about content, and that occupies about 90% of the pages. But Part, the remaining part, which is uh, uh, perhaps equally important, is about mathematical practices. These um, practices are, in some sense, supposed to be school-appropriate versions of the practices of the discipline. And uh, as I understand it from conversations today, there's some version of that present in the new uh, science standards and the new science uh, framework on which they were based. Um, so the idea is, um, well, let me progress into my slide so that I can make use of it. <laughs> so what's important about the Common Core standards? Well, as I mentioned, the main thing is that they're common. They were shared by I think it's 45 out of the 50 states already. And it brings us into much better uh, uh, coordination with the systems in the high-performing countries with which we, like to, we would like to compare ourselves. And they give central role to mathematical practices. And uh, this has precursors in the NCDM standards where they talk about process standards, and a version of this also appeared in a report of the National Research Council called Adding It Up, where they attempted to make a portrait of what a mathematically competent student would look like. Uh, and they called these proficiencies. There were five strands, and they emphasized that these strands were interwoven. You couldn't, I, it's like teaching tennis and spending a year on your backhand another year on the serve. Um, so uh, there's some history of efforts to do this, but they're, they're given somewhat more prominence in the common court. And uh, I hope you'll excuse my voice, I'm just on the hopefully last stage of uh, uh, cold, and uh, you'll have to excuse the gravel. So what are these practices? The word practice has a lot of different uses. <coughs> uh, I'll borrow four versions from uh, Magnus and Leonard. Uh, first, practice in the sense of rehearsal, of doing something over and over again to gain skill and proficiency. Another is the practice of a profession, like medicine, law, mathematics, teaching. The practices are the things that practitioners of that profession do. And those are the senses in which I'll be talking about this today. And finally, there's the notion of practice as in theory versus practice, or theoretical versus practical. Um, so we're interested in the green and the red here, but the blue also plays a role. It's not emphasizing one thing is not intended exclusion of the others. So practice in school mathematics has largely been, uh, in recent years, about drill and practice. Not that this happens in all classrooms, but the, the norm in the majority of US classrooms is based on doing drill sheets of problems. And the Common Core State Standards offers the possibility of reorienting, reorienting mathematics instruction at school around a more robust conception of what it means to be mathematically competent. And this has implications for issues of equity. Uh, namely, people are good in mathematics in lots of different ways, uh, and the abilities, 
across the spectrum rather unevenly, and it's important to recognize uh, that kind of competence in places that it's often unexpected and often expressed in forms that are less than standard or familiar. So this is the list of the headings of the mathematical practices in the common core. Of course, these words don't tell you a great deal. Each of them in the common core is followed by roughly half a page of elaboration, which go a little ways further toward explicating them. But uh, <coughs> these things are very hard to capture in words. Uh, the one difficulty with all of these policy documents has been the difficulty of uh, assuring ourselves of some uniformity of interpretation. So there are many people who would claim to be implementing these ideas, and yet when you observe them, especially the authors of the documents observe them, we see that they've completely missed the point. So uh, being practices, it's important to understand not only what they mean rhetorically, but what they mean uh, when enacted. 